indeed, not just heavy alcohol consumption of 12 to 24 or more drinks per week, but also light to moderate alcohol consumption of any type, wine, beer, spirits, etc., does reduce the thickness of the brain. It really does reduce cortical thickness. In fact, it actually scales with the amount of alcohol that people drink. And this has been well documented in a number of different studies. I can provide a link to several of these. One of the more striking ones actually shows that there's almost a dose dependent increase in shrinkage of gray matter volume and in these white matter tracks, these uh, axons, these wires as it would, that connect different neurons as a function of how much alcohol people drink. And that's also what's been seen in this recent study uh, that I referenced at the beginning and that's in the show note captions. So again, probably the best amount of alcohol to drink would be zero glasses per week or ounces per week. For those of you drinking low amounts of alcohol, make sure you're doing other things to promote your health. And for those of you that are drinking moderate, and certainly for those of you that are heavy drinkers, please uh, do everything you can to move away from that and to quit entirely. But even for the moderate consumers of alcohol, you are going to want to be aware of some of the negative health effects and do things to offset those if indeed you're not going to stop drinking or reduce your intake. One of the really bad effects of alcohol, but that's extremely well documented, is the fact that alcohol, because of this toxicity of acetylaldehyde and related pathways, can alter DNA methylation, it can alter gene expression, that can mean many things in different tissues, but it is associated with a significant increase in cancer risk, in particular breast cancer, and in particular because breast tissue is present in both males and females, but in women, it's especially vulnerable to some of the DNA methylation changes. Well, breast cancer in women has a relationship to alcohol intake and alcohol intake has a relationship to breast cancer in women. In fact, there has been proposed to be a f anywhere from four to 13% increase in risk of breast cancer for every 10 grams of alcohol consumed. How much is 10 grams? Well, there we need to think a little bit about the variation in the amount of alcohol in different drinks across the world. Different countries serve different sized drinks and have different concentrations of alcohol in those drinks. So without going down too much of a rabbit hole and just giving you some good rules of thumb to work with, there have been studies of the percentage of alcohol included in different drinks and the sizes of different drinks that are served in different countries. And here's a kind of a, a patchwork of, of those findings. In Japan, one beer, one glass of wine, or one shot of liquor as it's served there tends to include anywhere from seven to eight grams of alcohol. In the US, one beer, which generally is 12 ounces, if it's in a bottle, one glass of wine or a shot of liquor tends to include about 10 to 12 grams of alcohol. And in Russia, one drink of the very sorts that I just described typically will have as much as 24 grams of alcohol because of the differences in the concentration of alcohols and the size of drinks that are poured in these different countries. Okay. Of course, there are other countries in the world. Those countries are also vitally important, but those are the ones that I extracted from the studies that I could find. What does this mean? Well, what we're talking about is that for every 10 grams of alcohol consumed, so that's one beer in the US, maybe a little bit more than one beer in Japan, or basically a third of a drink in Russia, there's a four to 13% increase in risk of cancer. That's pretty outrageous, right? And you might think, wait, how could it be that, you know, this stuff is even legal? Well, look, it's, as I described before, it's a toxin. It's also a toxin that people enjoy the effects of. I mean, in the US, at least they tried prohibition. Um, it certainly did lead, yes, did lead to a reduction in alcohol induced health disorders, in particular cirrhosis of the liver. It also led to a lot of crime because it became a, a substance that a lot of people still wanted and that people were willing to break the law in order to provide, or I should say to sell and provide. Let's go back to talking about the biochemical and neurochemical effects of alcohol on the brain. There are also dramatic changes in the activity of neurons that control the release of so-called serotonin. Serotonin is a neuromodulator. It changes the activity of neural circuits and many neural circuits, in particular those involved in mood and feelings of well-being. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in serotonin 
because of a study that was released that showed pretty conclusively that serotonin levels can't really explain depression and depression-like symptoms. I wanna make it very clear that although that study did show that serotonin levels are not necessarily associated with depression, the study was interpreted by many to mean that SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which uh, have the net effect of increasing serotonin, so these are things like Prozac, et cetera, that those drugs are somehow not helpful because they increase serotonin and serotonin isn't involved in depression. That logic doesn't really hold together, so I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to just clarify what really occurred there, and then we'll talk about how serotonin relates to alcohol consumption in things like feeling good and in depression. The key thing is this, SSRIs can help alleviate depression. That's right, SSRIs can help alleviate depression. They are often not always associated with side effects, dosage is very important, et cetera. But they probably support relief from depression by changing neural circuits, not necessarily by increasing serotonin itself. That is, increasing serotonin with these drugs likely change the neural circuits involved in mood, allowing people to feel better through so-called neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to change itself in response to experience. So there's a bit of confusion. And again, I'm using this episode on, on alcohol to highlight some of the confusion because I think it's timely because the study just came out and there's a lot of chatter about this out there that when people are depressed, it's not necessarily because serotonin levels are low. However, if serotonin levels are increased with things like Prozac, Zoloft, and other SSRIs, oftentimes there is, yes, a relief from depression, but that's probably not because of restoring serotonin levels per se. It's probably because serotonin facilitates the changes in neural circuits that need to occur in order for people to feel elevated mood, okay? So again, that's a bit of a tangent and aside, but I do think it's a vital one for people to know about. Again, if you're thinking about taking SSRIs, you're currently taking them and you've heard this news, definitely talk to your doctor. Again, there is great utility for some of these SSRIs and also in conditions like OCD, they've been shown to be very beneficial. So we really don't wanna throw SSRIs out as a potentially valuable treatment. Getting back to the effects of alcohol on serotonin, it's very clear beyond any doubt that many of the circuits in the brain that are involved in mood and feelings of well-being and also sort of self-image and how we see ourselves employ the neuromodulator serotonin and alcohol when we ingest it and it's converted into acetylaldehyde, it goes and that acetylaldehyde acts as a toxin at the very synapses, the connections between the serotonergic neurons and lots of other neurons. In other words, when we ingest alcohol, the toxic effects of alcohol disrupt those mood circuitries at first making them hyperactive. That's right, making them hyperactive. This is why people become really talkative. People start to feel really good after a few sips of alcohol, at least most people do. And then as they can ingest more alcohol or as that alcohol wears off, serotonin levels and the activity of those circuits really starts to drop. And that's why people feel less good. And typically what they do, they go and get another drink and they attempt to kind of restore that feeling of well-being and mood. 